Hello and welcome to the Introduction to Restorative Justice Practices Pause and Play video. My name is Jen Vermillion and I am a restorative trainer and coach with the San Diego County Office of Education. This video will be broken up into five segments. Segment one will be about understanding restorative justice practices. Segment two will discuss reframing student behavior and our responses to it. Segment three will talk about understanding community building circles. Segment four, we will be practicing community building circles. And then segment five, we'll have some closing thoughts and feedback. For this video, it will be helpful to have a facilitator who is designated to pause the video when prompted to keep track of the timing for the group discussions, organize small groups as prompted in the video, and chart the group responses when prompted to. You may also need some chart paper and markers, or a whiteboard works too, a stack of blank paper and multiple markers, and then finally, make sure you have the accompanying circle packets and community agreements that are provided for you. This video will be an introduction to RJP, so some of you may be more familiar with others regarding these concepts, and you will be integral in helping to share your knowledge and ideas with others on your team who are maybe not as familiar. It's also important that as a team, you are getting the same foundational knowledge together because if as a site, you all start out on different places in your restorative journey, then you're going to end up in wildly different places. So without further ado, let's get started. Understanding Restorative Justice Practices, Segment 1. There's an old parable about a river. In the story, there are some men fishing down river. One of them looks up and sees a child floating down the river struggling to stay afloat, and quickly the men jump into action and they pull the child from the river. The child was okay and was sent back home, and the men continue fishing. A few minutes later, the men see another child floating down the river, so they pull the child out. Once again, a few moments pass, and they see yet another child floating down the river, so they pull the child out, and she was sent back home just like the others. This time, however, one fisherman says to the other, let's go upstream and see what's happening. Upon arriving, the men realize that there's a bridge that crosses the river, which was broken, and as children were attempting to cross it, they kept falling in. So the men, along with help from the other villagers, fix the bridge, and wouldn't you know it, the children stopped falling in. You're going to go ahead and pause here, and then take a couple minutes and share amongst your group what do you think is the relevance of the river, and how does it connect to our role in education? Pause the video. Take a couple of minutes and share amongst your group. What do you think is the relevance of the river? How does it connect to our role in education? Hopefully you had some good discussion come out of your group. I'm sure that you realize one point of the story is that we can keep plucking kids out of the river or we can address the root of the problem. Also, fixing the bridge was not just one person's job. The whole village participated. And just like our education system, everyone from the person standing at the front gate, to the cafeteria workers, to the teachers, aides, admin, parents, and guardians, we all have a role to play. Now, over time as human beings, we've had to grow and adapt. For instance, this 19th century vehicle worked for a while. However, it would not be sufficient to meet our 21st century needs. Can you imagine driving this through LA traffic at rush hour? So we adapted, and now we have something that is a little bit more modern and meets our needs as a society. Similarly, we've learned quite a bit about baby gear, safety regulations, and testing. In case you don't know what this is, this was a real device that would be hung out of a window for babies to be kept in, because the thought around it was that the fresh air was gonna be good for their lungs. We now know, probably with some trial by error, that this is a bad idea. So we pivoted, and now we have something that's a little bit safer. Another example, this was a legitimate way of addressing a toothache once upon a time. No doctor, at least not one with a legitimate license, would recommend this anymore. I'm sure it was very effective, but of course we realized we had to pivot and do things differently, so now we do. In so many ways, we've learned and shifted and made changes based on new data and the needs of our society. Yet here we have a 19th century classroom and a modern day classroom. I'm not saying that we haven't changed anything about our modern education system, but in a lot of ways we are still doing things the way that we've always done it. And in a lot of ways we desperately need to pivot. And while restorative justice practices isn't the only tool to help us do that, it is one that can help shift things in a positive direction. 
Now, one of the biggest misconceptions about restorative practices is that there's no accountability. In actuality, restorative justice practices requires a great deal of accountability. It's just about how we perceive accountability and where we place our priorities. For instance, traditionally we focus on the school and the rules being violated. If a fight occurs between two students, yes, of course a rule was broken, but isn't the more important thing that a person and relationships were violated? Usually, we focus on finding out who's guilty instead of focusing our attention on the needs and the obligations of those involved. And typically, we equate accountability with punishment when we should help students to understand the impact of their actions and help them participate in repairing the harm that they caused. Traditionally, all of the attention is on the offender and usually the victim isn't even involved in the process. In a restorative paradigm, the offender, victim, and other impacted parties all have a role and a voice in the process. Finally, when we take a traditional approach, there's no opportunity for remorse or amends to be made, but a restorative approach gives opportunity for authentic amends and expressions of remorse to be made. I find that typically when people think about restorative justice practices, they either think about gathering in circles and talking about our day or how we feel, or they think about the reparative side. Both of those things are involved in restorative practices, but there's a lot more involved. Here's a three-tiered model of restorative practices. It's broken up between tier one, which is where a lot of our proactive relationship building practices happen. You may have things like setting your classroom agreements, morning meetings, community building circles, or circles for problem solving, academic circles, or SEL circles. This should be what all students are getting. They are our universal supports. And then next we have our tier two interventions for some students. These might be things like peer mediation, restorative conferencing, using affective statements, and positive redirection. You might even offer some behavioral incentives for some students if they are bringing in other behavior supports like PBIS. It's meant to address behavior challenges or harm that have occurred. This can include classroom and office managed processes. If we're using a tier one support consistently and with fidelity, there will be less need to use a tier two approach. It won't eliminate it, but it will reduce it. And no matter what interventions we use, we never stop using tier one. We never stop building relationships and community. And lastly, tier three is where our intensive and individualized interventions happen. This is typically where a student has been removed from our community, whether it's suspension, expulsion, or incarceration, and now they've returned. Instead of crossing our fingers and hoping that they've learned their lesson or will find their way, we should be meeting with them and their family to see where we can support them. We should be explicitly communicating that they are a valued member of our community who is welcomed in this space because if they don't feel that from us, then there's not a lot of incentive to do better and they won't feel like there's anything to be restored back to. Now you might already be doing some of these or other things that are very restorative, even if they're not a part of this restorative toolbox. For instance, I was working with a middle school that had a student mentor program for new students. Now you won't find that in a restorative practices handbook, but that was a very restorative approach because it was working to support students before conflict has happened. Reframing student behavior and our responses to it. Segment two. Now in order to shift our paradigm and begin implementing some of those tiered approaches, it requires us to shift the way that we think about discipline. It also requires us to think differently about students and how we offer support. So instead of thinking, oh, well, the parents just never taught the student to behave, thinking instead that, well, maybe the student could benefit from some more social, emotional, behavior skill instruction. And instead of thinking that there must just be a lack of structure at home and no parental support, thinking that, well, maybe the current school environment needs to offer more structure as a way to support the student. And instead of thinking they must just not be getting attention at home, so that's why they're seeking negative attention at school, thinking the student might need some more positive attention and feedback at school to prevent misbehavior. Now, some of the things under deficit thinking may be true. The student may have a lack of structure or parental support at home, but when we stop there, we stay in problem mode. Conversely, when we take a support focused view, we begin to problem solve and figure out how we can do our best to meet the student where they're at and provide the support that they need to meet our expectations. Now, you're gonna pause the video here and have a five minute discussion as a whole group about what are some other forms of deficit thinking that we might be tempted to take. Then come up with a support focus lens instead. Your facilitator should chart your group responses on a chart paper or on the whiteboard. Go ahead and pause the video here. 
Pause the video. What are some other forms of deficit thinking we might be tempted to take? Then, come up with a support-focused lens instead. Your facilitator should chart your group's response on some chart paper or on a whiteboard. One thing that we often say, and you may have heard it before, is that all behavior is communication. Sometimes we misunderstand what's being communicated, and often even our students don't understand where their own behavior is coming from. Now, let's think about a hypothetical situation. You've been feeling like you're carrying the lion's share of responsibilities at home, you're feeling underappreciated at work, and this last weekend your in-laws were visiting and making passive aggressive comments about how tidy your house is. Now, imagine that the next morning you come downstairs to find that your spouse or partner has neglected to do the dishes like they said that they would. Now, this completely triggers you and you go off at them about it. Now, was this really about the dishes? Maybe, in part, but it was really about a lot more than that, wasn't it? You may have been experiencing a sense of shame from your in-laws, and now you've entered into what we, or rather what Dr. Donald Nathanson calls the compass of shame. Nathanson found that there are four primary responses to shame. People who withdraw might isolate themselves, run away, draw into themselves, and cut off connections. This might be the kid that stops showing up to school altogether. Now, people who attack self turn their anger inward. This can lead to self-criticism, self-deprecation, self-harm, or contempt towards oneself. Now, people who avoid focus on diverting attention and using distraction techniques to generate neutral or positive feelings. People using this response are motivated to minimize the conscious experience of shame. Sometimes that's through denial or through addictions. This might even be the kid who is at school but is completely checked out. People who attack others reduce others' worth to boost their own self-esteem. They might blame, lash out, or put others down to alleviate their own negative feelings. The way that we show up and interact with a child, or adult for that matter, can greatly impact whether they enter the shame spiral continue in it, or get out of it. Now, I've heard some people say that shame can be a good thing, that it can help us correct unwanted behavior. But I want you to consider the difference between guilt and shame. Brene Brown says, I believe that guilt is adaptive and helpful. It's holding something that we've done or failed to do up against our values and feeling psychological discomfort. Brene also says, I define shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. So in a sense, guilt is what happens when we act out of alignment with our own values and we feel bad about it. The feeling originates from within ourselves, kind of like the Jiminy Cricket on our shoulder. Now we can grow from guilt. It can help redirect us into the right direction. Shame, on the other hand, says that who we are as a human is the problem, and it's usually an external voice telling us that. Now, we can't grow from a place of shame. When I've experienced shame, I tend to attack others and blame someone else because the feeling that there is something wrong with who I am as a person is just too painful. But then I go to attack self, and all those self-deprecating feelings start to surface. What I tend to need to get out of that place of shame is space to process. And then I need someone to listen and remind me of who I really am. What about you? Do you tend to withdraw? Do you attack self, avoid, or attack others? And what helps you get out of that place of shame? I'd like you to pause this video and take two minutes to share your thoughts with a neighbor. Pause the video. Take two minutes to share your thoughts with a neighbor. Do you tend to withdraw? Do you attack self, avoid, or attack others? What helps you get out of that place of shame? Now this is what we call the social discipline window. This was adapted from the International Institute of Restorative Practices. You'll notice on one side you'll have expectations and on the bottom you have support. Now both of these things in and of themselves are good things. It's good to have high expectations for ourselves and for others. And likewise, it's good to feel supported and to support others. However, when we are really, really high in expectations but really low in support, that's when we're being more punitive. We're doing things to people. This is where you might hear things like, what's well, my way or the highway, or do as I say, not as I do. On the flip side, if we're super duper supportive, but we don't have very high expectations, that's when we're being more permissive. Oftentimes, restorative practices gets misinterpreted as permissive practices. 
This is where you'll see a lot of enabling types of behaviors. You may hear things like, well, boys will be boys, or they're only kids, or, well, they don't know any better. And then when we have neither expectation nor support, that's where we're being neglectful. We're not doing anything at all. In my mind, this conjures up an image from an 80s rom-com where the substitute is sitting with their feet up, reading the newspaper while chaos just ensues behind them. But where we really want to be is this sweet spot where we're still holding high expectations and high support. We want to do things with others. Now, as an anecdote, when my son was about two and a half, we were living with another family who had a little girl about a year younger. The little girl at one day snatched a toy out of my son's hand, so he pushed her, and she fell on the floor and began crying. Now, I could have gone over and berated him and said, you know, what were you thinking? You know that we don't push people, and then sent him to timeout. Now, that would have put me in the two box. Or I could have made excuses like, well, she did snatch the toy, or well, boys will be boys. Now, that would have put me in the four box. Or I could have walked away and just pretended like I didn't see it at all, and that would have put me in the not box. But what I did instead was walk over to him, and while the girl's parents were comforting her, I said, hey, buddy, I see that Catherine is crying. Do you know why she's crying? He says, Catherine feels sad. I said, I see. Well, what kind of things make you feel sad? He says, what makes me feel sad when mommy's mad at me? And I said, when you feel sad, what kind of things help you feel better? He says, hugs make me feel better. I say, is there anything that you could do to help Catherine feel better? And he thinks for a moment and says, I could give her a hug. I said, that would be great. Is there anything else you could do? He thinks and says, I could say sorry for pushing her. I said, that's a great idea, buddy. Let's go do that together. Now, he already knew the expectations because we'd set them before. So he knew that he wasn't supposed to push other people. So when he didn't meet those expectations, I met him where he was at and I helped him to understand how to make it right. Now let's look at how this might show up in a classroom environment. In just a moment, your facilitator will separate you into four different groups. One group will discuss what a punitive classroom would sound like, look like, and feel like, both from the student and teacher perspective. Another group will do the same thing for the neglectful classroom, one group will have the same discussion about the permissive classroom, and another group will discuss what a restorative classroom would sound like, look like, and feel like. If your group is sitting at tables, then your facilitator will determine which tables will discuss the punitive, neglectful, permissive, and restorative windows. When your groups are done with the activity, share out the main points of your discussion with the larger group. Go ahead and pause the video now and take 15 minutes to complete this activity. Pause the video. Take 15 minutes to complete this activity. Your facilitator will determine which tables will discuss the punitive, neglectful, permissive, and restorative windows from both a teacher and student perspective. Now we're gonna switch our attention to one of the most commonly used tier one tools in restorative justice practices, circles. Understanding community building circles, segment three. There are many ways that we can use circles across all the tiers. We can even use circles at a tier two and three level to support and hold students accountable for their actions. But since we're talking about tier one and proactive practices, we'll save that for another video. In tier one, we can use community building circles. And this is where we're gathering as a group and we create a sense of belonging through sharing bits about ourselves. We'll practice this one later on in the video. A learning or curriculum circles would be comparable to a Socratic seminar. Here, we're sharing our responses to the curriculum in a circle shape so that everyone gets an opportunity to share and listen. A talking or an issue circle is a way for different voices or opinions to be shared and heard. This might be something like how to address bullying if you happen to see it, or opinions on dress code in school. A celebration circle is to honor or to recognize an important moment or achievement. Healing circles at Tier 1 is to share something challenging that the whole group is dealing with. For example, I once led a healing circle for staff at a middle school when their previous principal, who many had worked under and cared deeply about, had suddenly passed away shortly after retiring. Everyone got to share memories of him and how his death had impacted them. Decision-making circles allow for the group to plan or make proposals about something like an ASB class, planning a school-wide social event, or your staff working through a new curriculum proposal. Now that you understand the different ways that you can use circles, let's take a closer look at a community building circle. 
In a moment, you're gonna watch a video of some students in a high school classroom from Oakland leading a community building circle together. A couple things I want you to realize is, one, this is a group who has clearly been practicing this for some time. This is not their first go at it. It takes time to build trust and the ability to share so vulnerably. Two, this is a circle with older students, but it can be adapted to work with younger students as well. Three, this circle includes an opening ceremony, class values, which are sometimes called ground rules, guidelines, or agreements. It has an icebreaker, sharing rounds, and a closing. Now, while circles can include all of these, they don't have to. In fact, the first few circles that you run, you may only want to do an icebreaker and your class values and then gradually incorporate more components. After the video, stop and discuss for three to five minutes your reactions and thoughts on the video. They come in, they're giggling, they're laughing. Yo. And there's just like a lot of kind of like giddy, intense energy. Coming from what? <laughs> and in the circle, and their their relationships with each other actually kind of like quiet something in them and allow them to be more present for each other. When we do circles here, before we do the circles, we sit down and like plan the opening ceremony. My great hope is to laugh as much as I cry, to get my work done and try to love someone. And I have enough courage to accept the love in return. Maya Angelou. And in high school especially, like, we don't have enough, you know, connections with each other sometimes, you know. Everybody just all focused on the work and, you know, stress at home and stuff like that. And circles create a space where people can talk about their feelings, about how they're doing home life. Now we will review our class values. The first one was being open. The other one is respect. When we share our values to respect each other and stuff like that, because you know, we all are still humans and people get sensitive sometimes. So we're trying to make sure you know that everybody feels comfortable and doesn't get their feelings hurt. Okay, now we will share an object that relates to hope. I have my, I hurt being black bracelet because um, I hope that everybody is proud of who they are. I got this play to win thing from a boyfriend. We exchange bands all the time. And this brings hope because like, it just keeps me going. My mom made this uh, necklace for me and it represents hope because she never had time to do anything for herself. They're being asked to be vulnerable to a group of people which is kind of like antithetical to what it's like to be a teenager, which is what's the best way to hide right now. So the first thing that I do is I share as deeply as I possibly can. I feel like if I can share deeply and from my heart and listen really attentively to other students, they're looking at me to see how I'm behaving. I have, you guys, you guys give me a lot of hope and stuff like that. So our advisory is like a family. I've been through police brutality, tragedies and stuff like that. And instead of me being depressed about life, I know I can come in and talk to my community. They understand. And most of the time, if it's something I'm going through, they've probably already been through it before. People act yeah, like they shy and stuff like that, you know. And like the icebreaker loses and, you know, everybody up, you know, we all get in a good mood and then we're ready to talk. The wind comes and blows. If you live in oh, the wind comes and takes anyone whose shirt is black. The wind comes and takes anyone that likes to play basketball. Anybody who has headphones. Anybody that lives in East Oakland. If you're wearing shorts. The wind comes and blows if you have on a pink shirt. I picked this talking piece. This show is hard and we're all a strong community. It's kind of like step up, step back, because you know, I am stepping up by, you know, putting myself out there and being a facilitator. But I'm also like stepping back because I'm letting other people talk as well. What's good about being a teenager? You get more freedom now. You get to know people really deeply. If you look back on your childhood, you realize that there's certain things that you couldn't do when you were that age. You get the taste of being an adult. Man. So, yeah, you're like. <laughs> I mean, I find it balanced to be serious and be funny. 
if we're saying something that's, you know, sad, that just changes the whole direction of the circle. So, I mean, eventually somebody has to say something to make the circle, you know, bring back to life, because if it's sad, nobody's going to want to talk again. And sort of like letting the circle alternate between serious and light. We can laugh in certain moments. We can allow this to become lighter so that we also stay more resilient in the circle. And, and laughing with them is really important. And it also shows I respect all of who they are. What's hard about being a teenager? Something you just want to do stuff that you think you're ready for but then when really you're not, and you just want to grow up too fast sometimes. When you're a child, you know how you're always so happy and stuff like that. Now you're a teenager and you know what stuff's happening in the world and like you feel sadder. I don't remember being happy. Like the closest time I remember that was when I was like six, so. The one thing I hate about being a teenager is like you can't be as happy as, as you were as a kid. I remember really wanting to leave home from really the time I was started high school. I had to just like sit with it and wait until I was old enough to leave the house, even though I wasn't necessarily ready. Well, I have more responsibilities now. Take care of my little brother and family members and everything. So it's really harder now. You have to learn how to say things without getting in trouble or like the right way how to say it without like getting an attitude. Before I came to Midwest, Oh, I didn't have no self-control. Like in class, I was the class clown. Like, and I never listened to my teachers. And getting suspended, I never cared. And every time I got a phone call home, I used to lie and say, um, "She lying. I never did that." When I'm in a circle, I feel opened up. The circles is a part of me treating people better because I see how people are when people open up, and I see how they're treated. And I know I wouldn't want nobody to treat me like that. They come into the room with nine years of experience of this is what kind of student I, I am. And I just think that's the power of a circle. You are exactly who you are as you are in relationships with your peers. Someone who she doesn't get to be most of the time. You can control yourself. You don't need nobody to tell you to stop. You know if you right or wrong. If you could change one thing about being a teenager, what would it be? Everyone should have a mentor, not only by your schoolwork, but like what goes on in your house. They're wondering why teenagers are like <laughs> becoming more and more obese, and it's because they don't feed us healthier foods. School should be more interactive because the best way to learn is hands on. They still see us like we're little kids, but they don't know what's going on in our minds. They don't know if we're maturing. What are the things teenagers can do to make a difference in their lives or others? Think about things twice before you do anything. That was my lesson learned. Because if I would have thought of the, about it um, the second time, I'd probably never been in the trouble I'm in. Don't be so negative. Once you're negative around people, like people get negative too. If you're positive, then everybody around you going to be more positive, even if they're around. Like, like their household is negative her ability to build relationships with her peers, to allow me to know her more deeply, to allow other people to help harness her energy of this is the kind of student I am. I think it's allowed her to stay here. So we're gonna do the closing ceremony. Um, Cause you have an opening one, so why not have a closing one? I mean, you know, like, you have to close it out with something, something good. This little basket is gonna go around. Mm -hmm. Everybody will pick a name and then you say appreciation. I want to appreciate Alfredo, because you're hella nice. I appreciate Matthew. You're a good friend, and, and I know I can trust you with stuff. I want to appreciate you because you're really nice, and you're really fun to hang out with, and you did a good job leading this. I appreciate Sarah because this whole week and last week, Sarah's just been making me laugh, and, um, like, she just got a good, like, um, attitude, and she's, like, so helpful. She helps me whenever I need help. I see her like a sister. I want to appreciate Pancho for staying strong after going through a lot and having to wear that and being under house arrest and not being able to go out. I want to appreciate you because on everything you do, you always give it, like, 120%. And, like, you really just express yourself in everything you do. And, <laughs> well, that's friends. <laughs> Everybody clap for Kui and Jennifer and yourself.
Pause the video. Discuss for three to five minutes your reactions and thoughts on the video. Now that you've learned a bit about circles and have seen what happens in a community building circle, it's time for you to experience being in one yourself. Practicing Community Building Circles, Segment 4. In just a moment, you're going to stop the video and gather in groups of about 10, ideally in a circle shape if your space allows it, and ideally with only chairs and no barriers between you. If not possible, just make the best with the space that you have. You can have less people in your groups, we just don't want it to be too large. I'm going to walk you through a community building circle that will include setting your community agreements, an icebreaker, check-in questions, one sharing round, and a closing. So go ahead, stop the video here, and gather in your groups. You'll stay in these groups for the remainder of the training. Then you'll play the video again, and I'll walk you through each piece of our circle. Pause the video. Gather into your groups of about 10 or less people. Grab a chair and try to form a circle. Ideally, do not have any barriers inside the circle. First, we're going to do an icebreaker. Icebreakers can be great for setting the tone and helping everyone get comfortable in the space. Plus, it's just fun. For this icebreaker, the person who has the longest hair will remove their chair from the circle. And if there are any other empty chairs, you can also move them aside. This person will stand in the middle and say something like, the wind comes and blows anyone who, and then make a statement about themselves like, the wind comes and blows anyone who grew up outside of Southern California. Now try not to choose things that are obvious like what color clothes you have. If the space does not allow you to play this activity, take a look at the circle packets provided for you and choose another activity. Another great one that I like to do with groups is the rock, paper, scissors activity. Go ahead, pause the video here and do 10 rounds of where the wind blows. Pause the video. Play 10 rounds of where the wind blows. Welcome back. Next, we're going to set our community agreements. In your packets, you have a set of these agreements, and the purpose of these is to make sure that everyone knows what's expected of them and to create as safe and comfortable of a space as possible. The agreements that we're gonna use in our circle today are maintain confidentiality, speak and listen with respect, be present, and speak one at a time. Pause the video and take about three minutes to discuss what each of these means to your group. And if there are any other agreements that you think would help serve the safety and comfortability of your group. If your group comes up with any other ideas, assign one person in the circle to write them down on some extra pieces of paper and then place them in the center of your circle with the other agreements. Pause the video. Take about three minutes to discuss what each of these means to your group and if there are any other agreements you think would help serve the safety and comfortability of your group. If your group comes up with any other ideas, assign one person in the circle to write them down on some extra pieces of paper and place them in the center of your circle with the other agreements. Now that our agreements are set, we're going to do a check-in. By the way, this is one restorative tool that doesn't need to only happen in a circle. You may not do circles every day, but you can do a check-in every day. One way to incorporate this into your classroom rhythms is by having students do a check-in when you're taking attendance. So instead of having them say here or present when you call their name, have them share a number of how they're doing that day or use any of the other check-in ideas listed in your packet. Even if you aren't in the classroom, this is an easy conversation starter and relationship builder to keep in your pocket and ask kids as they're passing through the halls or at lunch. Now for our check-in. So starting with the person whose birthday is coming up next, share how you're doing today on a scale of one to 10. One being not so great and 10 being fantastic. And if you feel comfortable enough, you can also share why you chose that number. This can be related to your personal or professional life, just whatever is present for you in this moment. After the first person shares, the person to their left can share next and so on and so on until everyone has shared. Go ahead, pause the video here and do your check-in. Pause the video. Share how are you doing today on a scale from one to 10. Repeat this process by having the person to the left share next. Now we'll begin our sharing round. Whoever has been teaching the longest in your circle will begin this round. You'll share what inspired you to serve in education and one positive impact that you hope to make. After you share, the person to your left will share next and so on until you make it all the way around the circle. Go ahead, pause the video here and begin your sharing round. 
Pause the video. Share what inspired you to serve in education and one positive impact you hope to make. After you share, the person to your left will share next and so on until you make it all the way around the circle. Closing thoughts and feedback. Segment five. Now we are going to close out our circle. Having a closing is helpful as a transitionary tool, especially if there's a lot of emotions or vulnerability that was expressed in the circle. Your packets have a list of different types of closings and openings that you can use in your circles. As a side note, an opening can help signal the transition into circle and can be a good mood setter as well, or you can just use your icebreaker as an opening like we did today. Today, we're gonna to close with answering the question, what is one takeaway from the training today? You'll start with the person sitting closest to the screen and then go around the circle until everyone has responded. So go ahead, pause the video here, and then begin your closing. And after you share, the person to your left will share next and so on until you make it all the way around the circle. Go ahead, pause the video here, and begin your closing round. Pause the video. Close by answering, what is one takeaway from the training today? Go around the circle until everyone has responded. Congratulations, you've completed your first circle together. I hope that this was a good experience for everyone. Before we end our time today, I wanted to share a few considerations. First, start small. As I mentioned before, you don't have to do a full circle every day starting tomorrow. You can begin by creating some classroom norms together or just do a check-in during attendance. Then eventually integrate other parts of the circle. Next, use pair shares and small groupings before a full class circle. Your class may be ready to circle up tomorrow and hit the floor running, but what I've noticed is that kids, and adults for that matter, sometimes need time to ease into a new practice. So the first few times when you're doing your sharing rounds, instead of having everyone go in a sequential circle like we did, do pair shares first, then groups of three, four, etc., until they get more comfortable sharing in the whole circle. Next, passing is okay. This can be controversial because there's a fear that if we allow passing, then no one will say a thing. A few tools or strategies to help mitigate this are, one, always invite the person who passed to share after everyone else has gone. Sometimes people just need a moment to think. Two, you may also wanna share the questions ahead of time or put them on the board where everyone can see. Three, if you're doing multiple sharing rounds, you can tell students that they get one pass. Four, you can have students write their responses on a piece of paper, toss them in the center of the circle, and then you can read them out loud. Five, you can also give a variety of questions at varying levels of vulnerability and let them choose the one that they want to answer. Six, the last tool is to have students come up with a list of questions that they would want to answer in circle, and then that would be the list that you choose questions from. Sometimes you'll find that that helps with buy-in. The next consideration is that you can only expect students to go as deeply as you're willing to go. It can also be helpful if you answer the question first because this helps to set the tone for how deep you want people to go. Remember, behavior is communication. If everyone is passing, then that might tell you that the questions are too deep or that you need to do pair shares for a while more before having everyone share as a whole group. Next, stop an unsafe circle. If student behaviors are making the circle feel unsafe even after you've reminded students of the agreements, stop the circle and explain that the space needs to feel safe for everyone, so you're going to end the circle for the day and try again the following day. I would then speak to the student or students who were engaging in the behaviors and without shaming them, let them know why the behavior felt unsafe and then check in with them to see if there's something that they need. Next, share with colleagues. Educators are some of the most creative individuals. Share what's working for you and where you're having challenges and then see if anyone has tried anything that might help. This is not about perfection. It's about trying new things and helping our students and ourselves to grow. Lastly, adapt everything that you heard today to best support your students. You may have heard something shared today and it may not fit exactly the way I described it with your students. Get creative. How might you adapt it to fit the needs of your students? I had one teacher who taught a mod severe classroom and they really thrived in circle when there was music playing. So she made a playlist of the songs that they liked and during each part of the circle would let the kids take turns being the DJ. As long as you are building relationships and community, you are doing it right. 
To close out our time together, I wanted to share the concept of a kintsugi bowl. If you're not familiar with this, it's a Japanese art form that takes broken pieces of pottery and mends them together with fine metals like gold and silver, and it turns it into this beautiful art piece. The interesting thing about kintsugi is that while it may get chipped and scratched through its life, it will never break again in the places that it was mended using this technique. I think about the work in which we do with students, whether it's in the cafeteria, greeting them at the gate in the morning, in the classroom, walking in the halls, or out in the community. We have a chance to mend the broken places, the places that have been chipped along the way, if we use the right tools. Thank you so much for being willing to participate in the Introduction to Restorative Practices Pause and Play video. Before completing this session, I would love if you could take a few moments to use the QR code to complete the feedback form. And if there's anything that the county office can do to further support you and your school, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you for your time and good luck on your restorative journey.